<sighs> the US. You see, when I'm online, I see stuff like this. And then when I put my phone down and go to the $5,000 class I pay money for, I get this. I'll explain this incident more in a future video. Anyways, sometimes I find safety in talking about the problems of a country I don't live in, since I don't really have to deal with them directly. Shout out Notches Bikes! Anyways, with that being said, today we're going to be talking about the problems with UK rail infrastructure. Welcome to the truth about the East Coast Mainline, episode number 5. Please exit through the rear door. Doors open. As always, thanks to my patrons. Your donations make this content possible. Why does every train in the UK have a top speed of 125 miles per hour? As me and Michael C have explained in the last episode, go check that out, the new class 800 IETs have a top speed of 140 miles per hour. The class 91s that make up the intercity 225s also have a top speed of 140 miles per hour. Even the class 43s that make up the famous HSTs reached 148 miles per hour in testing. The thing is, none of these trains actually go this fast in service. I mean, except for the class 395s which we covered in the other series, but I don't count high speed rail that the UK was forced to build by the French. But anyways, why does this barrier exist? The short answer is outdated signaling technology. Alright, bye! You know, some people got the attention span of fruit flies nowadays, so you gotta give them a short answer with no explanation. But for the rest of you, to give you the long answer, let me tell you how the current signaling works. The current signaling setup across the majority of the UK is with something called line signaling. Line signaling in the UK primarily uses modern color light signals, which are controlled through block signaling systems like absolute block signaling and track circuits or axle counters to maintain safe train movement and prevent collisions. Signals display aspects of green, clear, yellow, caution, or red, stop, with multiple yellow signals, double yellow, or single yellow to provide advanced warnings on high-speed routes. Safety systems such as Automatic Train Protection or ATP supplements line size signals by enforcing speed limits and ensuring drivers acknowledge warnings and don't pass red signals. Now on the East Coast Main Line, the infrastructure itself, aside from the signaling equipment, is able to support speeds of 140 miles per hour. This allowed a non-stop run of 3 hours and 29 minutes between London in Edinburgh on September 26, 1991. These tests were done using a fifth signaling aspect between Peterborough and Stoke Tunnel. Flashing green. After an ordinary steady green aspect, the next signal would show a flashing green aspect, authorizing the driver to push the train up to 140 miles per hour. Once encountering a steady green aspect again, the driver would reduce the speed to no greater than 125 miles per hour so that they could be ready to react to subsequent signals. However, the testing found one slight, maybe kind of big issue. Drivers couldn't be expected to consistently and accurately interpret and respond to line side signals when driving at higher speeds. This forced regulations to change throughout Britain, requiring the use for in-cab signaling whenever running service trains above 125 miles per hour. In-cab signaling provides drivers with real-time speed limits and movement instructions directly on a display within the cab. The East Coast Main Line south of Grantham is getting European Rail Traffic Management System Level 2, also known as ERTMS, which is full in-cab signaling. This project is known as the East Coast Digital Program or ECDP. The signaling upgrade is currently being installed from King's Cross to Soak Tunnel. In order to replace the aging signaling infrastructure on that section of the line that's nearing the end of its lifespan. Which to me makes sense because if you're going to replace the aging equipment, might as well replace it with something more modern. In-cab signaling is also more sustainable, as there's less physical equipment to maintain. That means less maintenance trips. And if the in-cab software isn't bugged, less service disruptions. With all that being said, 
It's estimated that with this upgrade to the East Coast mainline, there will be a 39% reduction in CO2 emissions. In-cab signaling will also allow trains to run closer together, meaning more aggressive timetables. So not only are we looking at an increase in train speed, but an increase in train capacity. Now, over 70% of trains on the East Coast mainline are already compatible with this type of signaling. And with more Class A hundreds coming online, that percentage is increasing rapidly. So now you're probably sitting on the edge of your seat asking, when will this be completed? Well, according to Network Rail, by 2030 or the early 2030s, which, yeah. And considering that there's no real certainty on whether or not the Class A hundreds will be able to run at 140 miles per hour, this time estimate is kind of disappointing. Because at that point, you have the right of way capable of 140 miles per hour, you have the trains capable of 140 miles per hour, and you have the signaling capable of 140 miles per hour. What more do you want from me? Now all of these signaling upgrades inevitably lead to the question of, what will be the purpose of having drivers? Why don't we just use self-driving trains? I mean, ERTMS, when mixed with ATO and ETCS, can achieve various levels of automation, from driver-supported modes to fully unattended operations. So why not just do the latter? Well, I can give you three reasons right now. Reason number one, even if the trains are traveling down a track or a right of way, which is seemingly predictable, there still are very unpredictable factors involved in, well, operating a train, which sometimes boils down to poor maintenance of the tracks and the infrastructure or the train itself. So I'm not talking about falling trees or a person getting on the tracks, which is a problem because AI has been known to be ableist and racist due to stereotypes often being used in training data, or just unrepresentative data in general for certain groups of people, which might not seem like a huge issue in face value, but is one when you have to face a literal trolley problem. I'd pull the lever. Bruh. Saving the rich man for $500,000 outweighs the loss of another life in a cold calculation. Which is reason number two, AI decision making when it comes to morally complicated issues. Which is the reason why driverless self-driving trains and driverless self-driving vehicles in general are only really successful when the majority of unpredictable variables are taken out. The last reason is, well, the most obvious. Take the card killed! Take the card killed! Take the card you can generally kiss goodbye the economy from the massive job loss. So while I'm not against driverless trains when they're purpose built from the start, with all the safety measures included from the beginning, I'm not too fond of a 100 plus year old rail line going down the driverless route. There's just too many risk factors. And the reality of it is, do we really want AI to take over every slither of our human lives? Because at that point, what is there even for us to do? You feel me chat? I love watching great train speed. Okay. Oh, oh. He actually left. Anyways, he'd probably say something like this. Thank y'all for 9k subscribers. And if I earn your like and subscription, I love you. And if you made it this far in the video, thanks for watching.